fire him. Mraz is now suing the Moody Blues and their manager for breach of contract, wrongful termination, and royalties. Tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, Court TV will bring you the conclusion of an administrative hit them for a while. Says he was a member and he's entitled to some damages. So stay with us for that through this break. Right afterwards, some Moody Blues coming up. Highlights of the day's trials. Watch In Court Today, weeknights at 8 and 11, only on Court TV. I'm Carol Randolph. It's my pleasure to serve as your guest anchor for the evening. For all of you lovers of rock and roll, entertainment law, or the law in general, today's case, Moran's versus the Moody Blues, should be of interest. Now, this is the case of a keyboard player who says the band owes him over $3 million. For more on the background of this case, Court TV's Steve Johnson has this report on the suit and the Moody Blues. Keyboardist Patrick Mraz, never in his wildest dreams, thought he would be what he is today, an ex-member of the Moody Blues. This successful British rock group, affectionately called the Moody's, has been making hit records for nearly 30 years. Nights in white satin. One of their best-known songs, Nights in White Satin, went to number two on the record charts in 1972. Many more hits followed over the years. In all, the band has had 21 songs make it to the top 100 list. In 1978, Swiss-born keyboardist Patrick Mraz joined the group. Mraz was a well-respected musician who had previously played with another successful band, the British rock group Yes. Mraz says that within two years after joining the Moody Blues, he reached an oral agreement with the group and became a permanent, lifetime member of the band. But several years later, Mraz says he noticed something was wrong. I discovered that uh, there's been some kind of a a plot to kind of ease me out. Mraz says in 1991, the band illegally fired him so they could split his share of the royalties. He says he is now destitute and is facing eviction from the California home he rents. It's one of the, the very um, true but very sad stories of rock and roll where rock and roll not, is not that glamorous, especially not for me. The Moody's say Mraz was never a lifetime member of the band, they say he was merely a musician who they hired before each tour or album they wanted him to work on. Moody's attorney Don Ingle says the band's decision not to offer Mraz a contract for the 1991 tour was Mraz's own fault. Mr. Mraz, in 1988, moved from England to the United States. And for the ostensible purpose of pursuing other aspects of his career, such as writing film scores, so in a sense, he left the Moody Blues. Now, Mraz is taking his former bandmates to court, suing them for breach of contract and royalties to the tune of some $3.7 million. But the Moody's remain undaunted. We're friends, and um, we know what the truth of, of this case is, and uh, we're, we've been together for long enough as a band, and we've come through a lot worse crisis than, than this. All right. With with me in studio this evening and for the next three hours is Martin Gold, who's been a regular on court television. He's an entertainment lawyer. He's been practicing for 30 years, and welcome. 
Thank you very much, Carol. I should say that you should kind of lead the way here. I'm the newcomer. <laughs> Let's talk about that very beginning statement. They were talking about an oral agreement and how difficult is it to really prove an oral agreement? What are we talking about, the elements? Well, uh, when people think of a contract, they normally think of a piece of paper signed by both sides. But uh, a contract generally does not have to be uh, in writing and signed in order to be binding. If there is a meeting of the minds, there can be uh, an oral statement by either side, by both sides, so that the, uh, the, uh, there is an agreement, and that's an enforceable contract. Well, now, all right, but we're upstanding citizens here. We're going to say that we did make this agreement, et cetera, but you know that that always doesn't happen. So how do you prove that when you've got individuals who are no longer friends? Well, uh, what will happen is we'll have evidence. The witnesses will testify. And uh, remember that we're in a civil case now, not a criminal case. And so the burden of proof is merely a weighing of the evidence by a preponderance of the evidence. There doesn't have to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the jury, or with part of this case, the judge, is going to decide who do they uh, believe a little bit more. And so they'll listen, the judge and the jury will listen to the evidence, weigh it, balance it, uh, and also look at all the surrounding circumstances and see what makes sense. And in addition to an oral contract, you can have a contract implied in law or implied in fact by uh, merely by virtue of the surrounding circumstances, the way that people get together. You have a couple of young people perhaps who get together and start playing and uh, become a band and then they have a contract. Well, I want to pursue that a little bit later, but we have some tape we want to get into now. It kind of sets things up. We've talked about the fact that you needed to have perhaps an opening statement or an explanation about what's going to happen, and you've just done that for us, Marty, and <laughs> we get a chance to see what's going on in the courtroom now with the uh, plaintiff's attorney, Neville Johnson, giving an opening statement. The defendants in this case, they're almost all, they're almost all here except for Justin Hayward. Uh, for the four uh, people who are remaining in the Moody Blues are Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Graham Edge, and Ray Thomas. With Patrick Moraz comprised a group known as the Moody Blues, one of the greatest bands in the history of rock and roll. The band has been in three incarnations. Started off with a hit called Go Now in 1964. The British invasion had a lead singer by the name of Denny Lane. He left the group and subsequently uh, was replaced and uh, Justin Hayward came in. In 1967 or so, the Moody Blues created a legendary album called Days of Future Past, which had Nights in White Satin, which has been a number one hit, I think, on at least a couple of occasions. Integral to the Moody Blues sound is this symphonic uh, melody, uh, symphonic sound that is, was created then by uh, the keyboard man in the group, a man by the name of Michael Pinder. And he did so utilizing a, uh, what was called a Mellotron. It doesn't, uh, it's not in utilization anymore, but it was uh, the forerunner of synthesizers today. You know, you can go into any computer, any, any store, and, and you can buy an instrument that will recreate the violin or uh, an entire orchestra. Well, back in those days, it was wires and computers and craziness and very difficult and a very cantankerous in instrument. But in any event, the, the Moody Blues were able to recreate this sound on stage. Your job here, we're gonna, I'm going to be jumping around a bit, but I want to give you some more general introductory statements. Your job here is to keep your minds open until you go into that jury room and you have those instructions in front of you. You are all judges here in this case. You're all like wearing, wearing black robes, they're invisible in one sense, but they're, you're all, you're going to be the judges here. You're the trier of fact. And what this case really involves is a, a tangled web of deceit false promises made by the Moody Blues. I'll get into the story in just a minute, but basically, Patrick Moraz spent 13 years as a member of the Moody Blues, and then they just threw him out on the street and said, you're history, buddy. You get no severance pay, you get nothing. You're not on the, you're not on the yeah, next tour. Uh, it's an opening statement, it seems like it's pure argument. Objection sustained. 
the evidence is going to show that these gentlemen were ruthless in the way that they treated Patrick Moraz, and they were very crafty, very crafty. It took them a long time to work it up. And participating, in some degree, was Tom Hewlett, this man sitting here in the gray suit, who is the manager of the Moody Blues and managed Patrick Moraz while he was in the Moody Blues and theoretically was helping Patrick Moraz after he was thrown out of the Moody Blues. The Moody Blues is a 25-year-old franchise. It's a money-making machine these days. Similar to perhaps the Beach Boys. You know, the Beach Boys have had maybe about one or two hits in the last 10 years. And coincidentally, Mr. Uh, Hewlett has been the manager of the Beach Boys for a long time, and we're not sure if he's still the manager when I took it. Objection, right now. Holy Objection, sustained. They're a franchise. They make a lot of money on the road. Just They have to go out and just play their greatest hits right now. Some of the other songs you may know, uh, Ride My Seesaw, Tuesday Afternoon, and a number of others. The second reincarnation of the Moody Blues after Denny Lane left the group was Hayward, Lodge, Pinder, Edge, and Thomas. That lasted till about 78. What happened was from 67 to 72, they had uh, extraordinary success. Their second album in the second reincarnation, I think, was called In Search of the Lost Chord, and there were, uh, there were others. And then they had an a, a, a extremely successful album called Seventh Sojourn that came out about 71 or so. Then they broke up because they wanted to pursue other, other interests. Uh, and they put out solo albums. Uh, you'll learn, for example, that Justin Hayward has put out three solo albums, all of which have been flops, that, uh, that uh, uh, Lodge and, and Hayward tried to get together at one point and put out a record called The Blue Jays, which had minor success. Uh, none of the other individual solo efforts really did much. But they tried, and... Uh, about 77, 78, they came back together in L.A. and worked at a place called the Indigo Ranch up in the Malibu Hills on an album called Octave that came out in 78. It was a miserable, wretched experience for all concerned. They couldn't get along. They, they just fought. And Is there relevance here? They were not getting along very well. And it was so miserable that Pinder said, I don't want to tour anymore with you gentlemen. It was about this time that uh, Hayward and Lodge were trying to play more of the keyboards, keyboards as well. Well, the Moody's wanted to tour to go out and support their octave record in 78. And they said, who are we going to get? Who, will, who can we get to, to go out and play this complicated music with these complicated instruments? Well, one person came to mind. In fact, really only one person was considered. His name is Patrick Moraz. Patrick Moraz is one of the most talented keyboard players in the history of music. Patrick uh, was born in Switzerland. and and grew up there and uh, was, uh, you know, worked uh, for the Swiss government and did, uh, and, 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 and devoted his whole life to music, to learning how to, how to play music. And is trained in, 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 and can play almost uh, any kind of music that exists, classical, <laughs> jazz. We're going to take a break uh, and we'll return to the Mraz versus Moody Blues case. Uh, he's had 17 <laughs> Welcome back. We're in the trial of Moraz versus the Moody Blues. We're going to rejoin the uh, attorney for the plaintiff, Neville Johnson, who had just begun in uh, the opening statement. Uh, he's had 17 or 19 uh, individual albums that he's had out on his own, irrespective of the Moody Blues. 
he uh, he initially uh, was in uh, various groups. One I think was called Refugee, and then in uh, the early '70s he became a member of Yes. A Yes is a, was a super group, like the Moody Blues were. Super group, one of the biggest groups in the history of of rock and roll. I mean, they're all flying around in their own Learjets kind of stuff, playing places as big as the Coliseum. And he was on the legendary Relayer album, the greatest album that Yes ever made, the legendary Relayer album. He played the keyboards. He uh, was no longer associated with uh, Yes in the, in the late 70s and uh, had been living in Brazil. And the Moody's uh, approached him on the day he met his wife as well and said, you know, we're looking for somebody to do our 78 tour. Would you be interested? I think he was in Miami Beach at the time. So he flew to London, where he met with Graham Edge, who's the man sitting there with the beard, who's the drummer of the Moody Blues. And Graham Edge had, uh, I guess, what you call a, an interview with him, in which they basically said, we are very interested in engaging you possibility you could, you know, this could be a permanent situation. And uh, the next step is uh, we need to play together. Patrick said, I'm very interested. And they went to a studio in London. <coughs> and they sat around for about two hours. They were all so nervous because they hadn't played together for so long that they finally said, okay, let's, let's go down. Patrick said, let's go down and stairs and let's, let's, let's play. Patrick had learned every one of their songs. In fact, he had to teach them how to play some of their material because they were so rusty. And it went great. He played like a champ. I, should, I need to mention at this point also what's happening technologically because what's also coming up at the same time is the Mellotron is becoming passe and synthesizers are starting to come into, into the world of, 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 of music. Computers technology, programming. Raz is leading the field. In fact, he's led the field since the beginnings of the Mellotron. He is on the vanguard. He had the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment that was necessary to create the Moody Blues sound. And he said, okay, let's try it out. They went on tour. It was fantastic. Lasted for a couple of years. After a couple of years, 1980, though, they said, you know, it's not working out too good because, Patrick, you're making more money than we are. We don't like that. So, uh, Graham Edge said to him, why don't you become a member of the band? Why don't we go equal partners on touring? Patrick said, all right. We'll, we'll split it. This was during the recording of, of, of pro, one of the greatest Moody Blues albums of all time, Long Distance Voyager. Patrick was, I think, initially supposed to work something like 14 weeks. It took over a year to make that record because the Moody Blues are slow and or perfectionists. And it would have cost them, you know, Argentina to pay Patrick for what he was worth and could have gotten at that time. So. They said, uh, well, we're gonna, we want to cut you in on the royalties on this as well. But you're not going to be totally an equal member because, you know, we spent all these, all these years building up the name of the Moody Blues. So Patrick said, okay, fine. And, but, you know, there's the possibility what will happen is that you will become a full equal member of the group at some time in the future. So he got 16% on that album. And then on subsequent albums, he got like 17 and a half until we get to the Keys of the Kingdom album, where, the, where, they, start put, where they put the dagger in at that point. Patrick was moved, moved, moved to England, moved to Cobham. They all live in a place called Cobham in Surrey, in the outskirts, beautiful area in England. And they all had their estates, and Patrick was living there, and... Bought, bought a house and, and, and lived there for until, I think he sold his house around about 78.
1981, this document was presented to Patrick Moraz. It says declaration. Uh, it was initially sent over by Ben Staley, who was one of the Moody Blues lawyers, to a guy named Stanley Munson, we'll hear his name, who was one of Patrick's lawyers. And it said, initially, in the draft written by Mr. Uh, Chapman, you know, you're not a member of the Moody Blues and you don't own the name. Well, Patrick never signed that document. There was some discussion, uh, correspondence, I think a fax went back from Munson to uh, Stavely, and the document was changed somewhat, and what it ended up saying was, if I leave the group, I don't own the name the Moody Blues. See, what was happening at that time in 81 was Pinder had sued them. Because Pinder showed up in England in 1981 and says, you're making a record without me. I'm one of the Moody Blues. Patrick didn't know anything about it. They forgot to tell Pinder he was out of the group. And Pinder sued him, and they settled, and Pinder went away, and... Long Distance Voyager came out. It was a remarkably successful, wonderful record on every level, culturally, artistically, musically, financially. And they toured, and it was even more successful than the Octave Tour. They're on with it. All right, we're going to take a brief pause right now to just kind of take a look, if you will, a rate, if you will, the plaintiff's opening statement, and we'll return and finish out that so that you'll have a chance to see it in its entirety. Marty, what do you think? Um, we've been kind of making notes, comments. What? Well, it's impossible for one trial lawyer to watch another. This is Monday morning quarterbacking. <laughs> Everybody wants right. to do that. That's right. Um, uh, what I must say is that uh, he, he's not giving the opening statement the way that I would have. Which I would would be, how would you do that? Much quicker. Um, I'd get right to the, to the core of the matter, set out the points, and leave out a lot of the detail. The detail diverts the jury's attention from the main issues that he's got to establish. I've lost track. I mean, I thought he started out by saying this was a breach of contract, and then from th that point on, and then the term he used, franchise. We were saying that. He doesn't mean that, does he? I don't think he does. Uh, a franchise is where a name is owned by one entity or an individual and then gives Somebody the else? right to, to use that name on certain terms and conditions to somebody else, like McDonald's. Mm -hmm. That can be a franchise operation. Nobody uh, created other groups around the country called the Moody Blues. So what we're talking about here is a contractual arrangement or perhaps a partnership arrangement. It, uh, normally a band uh, where a bunch of people are getting together um, without any written document would be a partnership arrangement of some kind. Now, I notice here that they have not sued for breach of partnership, uh, and I'm interested in hearing why not. Well, also, I, I thought, and I don't know whether or not this was a tactic on his part, but Engel uh, objecting at uh, different places in the opening statement. Trial tactic, or perhaps he was uh, legitimately concerned about the issues he was raising? Well, Don Engel is a very experienced uh, an, an excellent trial lawyer, and he knows what he's doing. Um, I think that uh, what he was trying to do, frankly, was to just throw uh, Mr. Johnson off his stride a bit, which he succeeded in doing. Uh, he objected three times. The first two times I saw that it was uh, sustained, and the third time the judge overruled it. So I don't think we'll hear much from Don Engel now, through, um, unless uh, Johnson does something pretty outrageous. What about the organizational aspect of his opening statement? It seemed to be that he, you know, he went into, I considered it to be extraneous information. Maybe, do we need to know he was in Brazil? I mean, I kind of lost the thread with that. Uh, I agree with you completely, Carol. I think that it's necessary for him to set out the main thrust of his case. What is he going to prove? Because uh, what an opening statement does is uh, it synthesizes the entire trial. The, the, the trial comes in piecemeal through witnesses. With, it's rare that one witness sees the whole event from beginning to end. You get a little from one witness, another from another. You may read some depositions, as we're going to hear here, I understand. Uh, um, and the opening statement is an opportunity for the lawyer to put it all together and say to the jury, I'm making a, my own contract with you. Here's my contract, and you hold me to it. Here's what I'm going to prove to you and he can set out the conclusory facts and put a little flesh on it and then sit down. 
Well, here's my contract to you. We're going to take a break. We'll come <laughs> right back, and we'll continue looking again at the plaintiff's opening statement. <laughs> Welcome back. We're just beginning the case of Mraz versus the Moody Blues. This is a situation where Mr. Mraz says the Moody Blues owe him in excess of $3.7 million. And we've just begun to hear the opening statements by Neville Johnson. And we'll return and hear these statements as they're in, in their entirety. There on what occurred basically from 80 or so until his termination in 1991 was there'd be a record, there'd be a tour, and Patrick would sign a contract each time. It was pretty much the same on each one. He got, as I said, a, a raise uh, in royalties at one point. He was presented on all of the album covers as a member of the Moody Blues. In fact, the Moody Blues' his own literature that they put out in their fan club as late as 1990, says Patrick Moraz is one of the Moody Blues. Every, everything, every document, every, every piece of publicity that ever came out on the Moody Blues while Patrick was in the group said Patrick Moraz is one of the five Moody Blues. And Patrick always understood, and you'll hear all the times it was confirmed by the Moody Blues to him, I'm a member for life for as long as I want to be here. In fact, the Moody Blues themselves say so. On many occasions, yes, Patrick is our member, our brother. Replace Pinder. The theme of this case is, and I, I don't want to get too esoteric, is uh, Animal Farm meets Lord of the Flies. All the Moody's are equal, but some are more equal than others. Meets Lord of the Flies, let's kill Piggy, my client is Piggy. They wanted more money, and that's what happened at the end of the day. They got tired of him saying, when am I going to get my full 20% share? And as technology caught up, so that the point now where you can hire people is not quite as difficult as before, they just said, why would I pay him his quarter of a million, 350 grand a year? You know, let's get somebody else. We cut, cut his price way down. And like I said, it's equal, but not entirely equal. They didn't split it up equally. Graham and Ray, they're the... They, they're the laggers. They're lagging behind because they don't control the group. The group is controlled by, by John Lodge and Justin Hayward. They run the group. Justin Hayward is a wonderful writer, great singer, front man of the group. Lodge is the bass player. He's written a couple of the hit songs, basically. Uh, he, his, his, his most successful one would probably be um, uh, I'm Just a Singer in a Rock and Roll Band which is not quite accurate because he's really a good businessman, as you'll see, and pays a lot of attention to business. These are very sophisticated guys. Well, what I'm saying is what happened is that Hayward and Lodge said, you know, we, we got to get rid of We got to get rid of Patrick. He's bugging us. He wants money. We're tired of paying him money. We can get Bias Bochelle, who replaced Patrick. We can get him at, I think it's three or four grand a week, whatever they're paying him rather than Patrick's 10 grand a week out on the road. And also, you know, we don't need them on the records anymore. We can, we can do the keyboard parts. We're so talented. We can do the keyboard parts ourselves. We'll get Tony Visconti, the producer. He doesn't, he wants to do the keyboard parts. You know, everybody's grabbing, hustling for tunes on these records. And that's why you see that Graham Edge never gets, unfortunately, really to write any songs. And Ray Thomas doesn't get to write very many songs either. Although Ray was actually the founder and leader of the Moody Blues and probably had the best voice. But Justin and John took over the group. And they determined that they were going to systematically exclude Moraz. It was clever. This is what happened on a musical level back in, 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 in 81. I mean, the movies needed to come together on, on a lot of different levels as people, as musicians, as... Suit and the Moody Blues.
Keyboardist Patrick Mraz, never in his wildest dreams, thought he would be what he is today, an ex-member of the Moody Blues. This successful British rock group, affectionately called the Moody's, has been making hit records for nearly 30 years. Nights in white satin. One of their best-known songs, Nights in White Satin, went to number two on the record charts in 1972. Many more hits followed over the years. In all, the band has had 21 songs make it to the top 100 list. In 1978, Swiss-born keyboardist Patrick Mraz joined the group. Mraz was a well-respected musician who had previously played with another successful band, the British rock group Yes. Mraz says that within two years after joining the Moody Blues, he reached an oral agreement with the group and became a permanent, lifetime member of the band. But several years later, Mraz says he noticed something was wrong. I discovered that uh, there's been some kind of a, a plot to kind of ease me out. Mraz says in 1991, the band illegally fired him so they could split his share of the royalties. He says he is now destitute and is facing eviction from the California home he rents. It's one of the, the very um, true but very sad stories of rock and roll where rock and roll not, is not that glamorous, especially not for me. The Moody's say Mraz was never a lifetime member of the band. They say he was merely a musician who they hired before each tour or album they wanted him to work on. Moody's attorney Don Ingle says the band's decision not to offer Mraz a contract for the 1991 tour was Mraz's own fault. Mr. Mraz, in 1988, moved from England to the United States. And for the ostensible purpose of pursuing other aspects of his career, such as writing film scores, so in a sense, he left the Moody Blues. Now, Mraz is taking his former bandmates to court, suing them for breach of contract and royalties to the tune of some $3.7 million. But the Moody's remain undaunted. We're friends, and um, we know what the truth of, of this case is, and uh, we're, we've been together for long enough as a band. Of Mraz is now suing the Moody Blues and their manager for breach of contract, wrongful termination, and royalties. Tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, Court TV will bring you the conclusion of an administrative hit them for a while. says he was a member and he's entitled to some damages. So stay with us for that through this break. Right afterwards, the Moody Blues coming up. Highlights of the day's trials. Watch In Court Today, weeknights at 8 and 11, only on Court TV. I'm Carol Randolph. It's my pleasure to serve as your guest anchor for the evening. For all of you lovers of rock and roll, entertainment law, or the law in general, today's case, Moran's versus the Moody Blues, should be of interest. Now, this is the case of a keyboard player who says the band owes him over $3 million. For more on the background of this case, Court TV's Steve Johnson has this report on the... We've come through a lot worse crisis than, than this. All right, with... With me in studio this evening and for the next three hours is Martin Gold, who's been a regular on court television. He's an entertainment lawyer. He's been practicing for 30 years, and welcome. 
Thank you very much, Carol. I should say that you should kind of lead the way here. I'm the newcomer. <laughs> Let's talk about that very beginning statement. They were talking about an oral agreement and how difficult is it to really prove an oral agreement? What are we talking about, the elements? Well, uh, when people think of a contract, they normally think of a piece of paper signed by both sides. But uh, a contract generally does not have to be uh, in writing and signed in order to be binding. If there is a meeting of the minds, there can be uh, an oral statement by either side, by both sides, so that the, uh, the, uh, there is an agreement, and that's an enforceable contract. Well, now, all right, but we're upstanding citizens here. We're going to say that we did make this agreement, et cetera, but you know that that always doesn't happen. So how do you prove that when you've got individuals who are no longer friends? Well, uh, what will happen is we'll have evidence. The witnesses will testify. And uh, remember that we're in a civil case now, not a criminal case. And so the burden of proof is merely a weighing of the evidence by a preponderance of the evidence. There doesn't have to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the jury, or with part of this case, the judge is going to decide who do they uh, believe a little bit more. And so they'll listen, the judge and the jury will listen to the evidence, weigh it, balance it, uh, and also look at all the surrounding circumstances and see what makes sense. And in addition to an oral contract, you can have a contract implied in law, or implied in fact, by, uh, merely by virtue of the surrounding circumstances, the way that people get together. You have a couple of young people, perhaps, who get together and start playing and uh, become a band, and then they have a contract. Well, I want to pursue that a little bit later, but we have some tape we want to get into now. It kind of sets things up. We've talked about the fact that you needed to have, perhaps, an opening statement or an explanation about what's going to happen. And you've just done that for us, Marty. And we get a chance to see what's going on in the courtroom now with the uh, plaintiff's attorney, Neville Johnson, giving an opening statement. The defendants in this case, they're almost all, they're almost all here, eat false promises made by the Moody Blues. I'll get into the story in just a minute. But basically, Patrick Moraz spent 13 years as a member of the Moody Blues, and then they just threw him out on the street and said, you're history, buddy. You get no severance pay. You get nothing. You're not on the, you're not on the yeah. next tour. It's an opening statement. It seems like it's pure argument. Objection sustained. The evidence is going to show that these gentlemen were ruthless in the way that they treated Patrick Moraz, and they were very crafty. Very crafty. Took him a long time to work it up. And participating, in some degree, was Tom Hewlett, this man sitting here in the gray suit, who is the manager of the Moody Blues and managed Patrick Moraz while he was in the Moody Blues and theoretically was helping Patrick Moraz after he was thrown out of the Moody Blues. The Moody Blues is a 25-year-old franchise. It's a money-making machine these days. Similar to perhaps the Beach Boys. You know, the Beach Boys have had maybe about one or two hits in the last 10 years. And coincidentally, Mr. Uh, Hewlett has been the manager of the Beach Boys for a long time, and we're not sure if he's still the manager when I took it. Objection, Your Honor. Holy hell. Objection sustained. They're a franchise. They make a lot of money on the road. Just They have to go out and just play their greatest hits right now. Some of the other songs you may know, uh, Ride My Seesaw, Tuesday Afternoon, and a number of others. The second reincarnation of the Moody Blues after Denny Lane left the group was Hayward, Lodge, Pinder, Edge, and Thomas. That lasted till about 78. What happened was from 67 to 72, they had uh, extraordinary success. Their second album in the second reincarnation, I think, was called In Search of the Lost Chord, and there were, there were others. And then they had a, 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 a except for Justin Hayward. Uh, four four, four uh, people who were remaining in the Moody Blues were Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Graham Edge, and Ray Thomas. With Patrick Moraz comprised a group known as the Moody Blues, one of the greatest bands in the history of rock and roll. The band has been in three incarnations, 
started off with a hit called Go Now in 1964, the British invasion, had a lead singer by the name of Denny Lane. He left the group and subsequently uh, was replaced and uh, Justin Hayward came in. In 1967 or so, the Moody Blues created a legendary album called Days of Future Past, which had Nights in White Satin, which has been a number one hit, I think, on at least a couple of occasions. Integral to the Moody Blues sound is this symphonic uh, melody, uh, symphonic sound that is, was created then by uh, the keyboard man in the group, a man by the name of Michael Pinder. And he did so utilizing a, uh, what was called a Mellotron. It doesn't, uh, it's not in utilization anymore, but it was uh, the forerunner of synthesizers today. You know, you can go into any computer, any, any store, and, and you can buy an instrument that will recreate the violin or uh, an entire orchestra. Well, back in those days, it was wires and computers and craziness and very difficult and a very cantankerous in instrument, but in any event, the, the Moody Blues were able to recreate this sound on stage. Your job here, we're gonna, I'm gonna be jumping around a bit, but I wanna give you some more general introductory statements. Your job here is to keep your minds open until you go into that jury room and you have those instructions in front of you. You are all judges here in this case. You're all like wearing, wearing black robes, they're invisible in one sense, but they're, you're all, you're gonna be the judges here. You're the trier of fact. And what this case really involves is a, a tangled web of deceit